Chapter 19 John Brooke Wake up, Demi, dear. I want you. Why, I've just gone to bed. It can't be morning yet. And Demi blinked like a little owl as he waked from his first sound sleep. It's only ten, but your father is ill, and we must go to him. Oh, my little John. My poor little John. And Aunt Jo laid her head down on the pillow with a sob that scared sleep from Demi's eyes and filled his heart with fear and wonder, for he dimly felt why Aunt Jo called him John, and wept over him as if some loss had come that left him poor. He clung to her without a word, and in a minute she was quite steady again, and said, with a tender kiss as she saw his troubled face, "'We are going to say good-bye to him, my darling, and there is no time to lose, so dress quickly and come to me in my room. I must go to Daisy.' Yes, I will. And when Aunt Jo was gone, little Demi got up quietly, dressed as if in a dream, and leaving Tommy fast asleep, went away through the silent house, feeling that something new and sorrowful was going to happen, something that set him apart from the other boys for a time, and made the world seem as dark and still and strange as those familiar rooms did in the night. A carriage sent by Mr. Lorry stood before the door, Daisy was soon ready, and the brother and sister held each other by the hand all the way into town. As they drove swiftly and silently with aunt and uncle through the shadowy roads to say goodbye to father. None of the boys but Franz and Emil knew what happened, and when they came down next morning, great was their wonderment and discomfort, for the house seemed forlorn without its master and mistress. Breakfast was a dismal meal, with no cheery Mrs. Joe behind the teapots. And when school time came, Father Bear's place was empty. They wandered about in a disconsolate kind of way for an hour, waiting for news and hoping it would be all right with Demi's father, for good John Brook was much beloved by the boys. Ten o'clock came, and no one arrived to relieve their anxiety. They did not feel like playing, yet the time dragged heavily, and they sat about listless and sober. All at once, Franz got up and said in his persuasive way, "'Look here, boys, let's go into school and do our lessons, just as if Uncle was here. It will make the day go faster, and will please him, I know.' "'But who will hear us say them?' asked Jack. "'I will. I don't know much more than you do, but I'm the oldest here, and I'll try to fill Uncle's place till he comes, if you don't mind.' Something in the modest, serious way Franz said this impressed the boys, for though the poor lad's eyes were red with quiet crying for Uncle John in that long, sad night, there was a new manliness about him, as if he had already begun to feel the cares and troubles of life and tried to take them bravely. I will, for one. And Emil went to his seat, remembering that obedience to his superior officer is a seaman's first duty. The others followed. Franz took his uncle's seat, and for an hour order reigned. Lessons were learned and said, and Franz made a patient, pleasant teacher, wisely omitting such lessons as he was not equal to, and keeping order more by the unconscious dignity that sorrow gave him than by any words of his own. The little boys were reading when a step was heard in the hall, and everyone looked up to read the news in Mr. Bear's face as he came in. The kind face told them instantly that Demi had no father now, for it was worn and pale and full of tender grief, which left him no words with which to answer Rob, as he ran to him, saying reproachfully, "'What made you go and leave me in the night, Papa?' The memory of the other father, who had left his children in the night, never to return, made Mr. Bear hold his own boy close, and for a minute hide his face in Robbie's curly hair. Emil laid his head down on his arms. Franz went to put his hand on his uncle's shoulder, his boyish face pale with sympathy and sorrow, and the others sat so still that the soft rustle of the falling leaves outside was distinctly heard. Rob did not clearly understand what had happened, but he hated to see Papa unhappy, so he lifted up the bent head and said in his chirpy little voice, "'Don't cry, mein Vater. We were all so good. We did our lessons without you, and Franz was the master.' Mr. Bear looked up then, tried to smile, and said in a grateful tone, 
that made the lads feel like saints. I thank you very much, my boys. It was a beautiful way to help and comfort me. I shall not forget it, I assure you. Franz proposed it, and was a first-rate master, too, said Nat. The others gave a murmur of assent most gratifying to the young Domini. Mr. Bear put Rob down, and standing up put his arm round his tall nephew's shoulder, as he said, with a look of genuine pleasure, This makes my hard day easier, and gives me confidence in you all. I am needed there in town, and must leave you for some hours. I thought to give you a holiday, or send some of you home, but if you like to stay and go on as you have begun, I shall be glad and proud of my good boys. We'll stay. We'd rather. Franz can see to us, cried several, delighted with the confidence shown in them. Isn't Marmar coming home? asked Rob wistfully, for home without Marmar was the world without the sun to him. We shall both come tonight, but dear Aunt Meg needs mother more than you do now, and I know you like to lend her for a little while. Well, I will, but Teddy's been crying for her, and he slapped Nursey and was dreadful naughty, answered Rob, as if the news might bring mother home. "'Where is my little man?' asked Mr. Bear. "'Dan took him out to keep him quiet. "'He's all right now,' said Franz, "'pointing to the window through which they could see Dan "'drawing Baby in his little wagon "'with the dogs frolicking about him. "'I won't see him. "'It would only upset him again. "'But tell Dan I leave Teddy in his care. "'You older boys, I trust to manage yourselves for a day. "'Franz will direct you, "'and Silas is here to oversee matters.' So goodbye till tonight. Just tell me a word about Uncle John, said Emil, detaining Mr. Bear as he was about hurrying away again. He was only ill a few hours, and died as he has lived, so cheerfully, so peacefully, that it seems a sin to mar the beauty of it with any violent or selfish grief. We were in time to say goodbye, and Daisy and Demi were in his arms as he fell asleep on Aunt Meg's breast. No more now. I cannot bear it. And Mr. Bear went hastily away, quite bowed with grief, for in John Brook he had lost both friend and brother, and there was no one left to take his place. All that day the house was very still. The small boys played quietly in the nursery. The others, feeling as if Sunday had come in the middle of the week, spent it in walking, sitting in the willow, or among their pets, all talking much of Uncle John and feeling that something gentle, just, and strong had gone out of their little world, leaving a sense of loss that deepened every hour. At dusk, Mr. and Mrs. Bear came home alone, for Demi and Daisy were their mother's best comfort now, and could not leave her. Poor Mrs. Joe seemed quite spent, and evidently needed the same sort of comfort, for her first words as she came up the stairs were, "'Where is my baby?' "'Here I is,' answered a little voice, as Dan put Teddy into her arms, adding, as she hugged him close, "'My Danny took care of me all day, and I was dud.' Mrs. Joe turned to thank the faithful nurse, but Dan was waving off the boys, who had gathered in the hall to meet her, and was saying in a low voice, "'Keep back. She don't want to be bothered with us now.' "'No, don't keep back. I want you all.' Come in and see me, my boys. I've neglected you all day. And Mrs. Joe held out her hands to them as they gathered round and escorted her into her own room, saying little, but expressing much, by affectionate looks and clumsy little efforts to show their sorrow and sympathy. I am so tired. I will lie here and cuddle Teddy, and you shall bring me in some tea, she said, trying to speak cheerfully for their sakes. A general stampede into the dining room followed, and the supper table would have been ravaged if Mr. Bear had not interfered. It was agreed that one squad should carry in the mother's tea, and another bring it out. The four nearest and dearest claimed the first honor, so Franz bore the teapot, Emil the bread, Rob the milk, and Teddy insisted on carrying the sugar basin which was lighter by several lumps when it arrived than when it started. Some women might have found it annoying at such a time to have boys creaking in and out, 
upsetting cups and rattling spoons in violent efforts to be quiet and helpful. But it suited Mrs. Joe, because just then her heart was very tender, and remembering that many of her boys were fatherless or motherless, she yearned over them and found comfort in their blundering affection. It was the sort of food that did her more good than the very thick bread and butter that they gave her, and the rough Commodore's broken whisper, "'Bear up, Auntie. It's a hard blow, but we'll weather it somehow,' cheered her more than the sloppy cup he brought her, full of tea as bitter as if some salt tear of his own had dropped into it on the way. When supper was over, a second deputation removed the tray, and Dan said, holding out his arms for sleepy little Teddy, "'Let me put him to bed. You're so tired, Mother.' "'Will you go with him, lovey?' asked Mrs. Joe of her small lord and master, who lay on her arm among the sofa pillows. "'Tours I will,' and he was proudly carried off by his faithful bearer. "'I wish I could do something,' said Nat, with a sigh, as Franz leaned over the sofa and softly stroked Aunt Joe's hot forehead. "'You can, dear. Go and get your violin, and play me the sweet little airs Uncle Teddy sent you last,' Music will comfort me better than anything else tonight. Nat flew for his fiddle, and sitting just outside her door, played as he had never done before, for now his heart was in it, and seemed to magnetize his fingers. The other lads sat quietly upon the steps, keeping watch that no newcomer should disturb the house. Franz lingered at his post, and so soothed, served, and guarded by her boys. Poor Mrs. Joe slept at last, and forgot her sorrow for an hour. Two quiet days, and on the third, Mr. Bear came in just after school, with a note in his hand, looking both moved and pleased. "'I want to read you something, boys,' he said, and as they stood round him, he read this. "'Dear Brother Fritz, I hear that you do not mean to bring your flock today, thinking that I may not like it. Please do. The sight of his friends will help Demi through the hard hour.' and I want the boys to hear what Father says of my John. It will do them good, I know. If they would sing one of the sweet old hymns you have taught them so well, I should like it better than any other music, and feel that it was beautifully suited to the occasion. Please ask them, with my love, Meg. Will you go? And Mr. Bayer looked at the lads, who were greatly touched by Mrs. Brooks' kind words and wishes. Yes, they answered like one boy, and an hour later they went away with Franz to bear their part in John Brooks' simple funeral. The little house looked as quiet, sunny, and homelike as when Meg entered it as a bride, ten years ago, only then it was early summer, and rose blossomed everywhere. Now it was early autumn, and dead leaves rustled softly down, leaving the branches bare. The bride was a widow now, but the same beautiful serenity shone in her face, and the sweet resignation of a truly pious soul made her presence a consolation to those who came to comfort her. "'Oh, Meg, how can you bear it so?' whispered Jo, as she met them at the door, with a smile of welcome, and no change in her gentle manner, except more gentleness. "'Dear Jo, the love that has blessed me for ten happy years supports me still.' It could not die, and John is more my own than ever, whispered Meg, and in her eyes the tender trust was so beautiful and bright that Joe believed her and thanked God for the immortality of love like hers. They were all there, father and mother, Uncle Teddy, and Aunt Amy, old Mr. Lawrence, white-haired and feeble now, Mr. and Mrs. Bear, with their flock, and many friends come to do honor to the dead. One would have said that modest John Brooke, in his busy, quiet, humble life, had had little time to make friends, but now they seemed to start up everywhere, old and young, rich and poor, high and low, for all unconsciously his influence had made itself widely felt, his virtues were remembered, and his hidden charities rose up to bless him. The group about his coffin was a far more eloquent eulogy than any Mr. March could utter. There were the rich men whom he had served faithfully for years, the poor old women whom he cherished with his little store, in memory of his mother, 
the wife to whom he had given such happiness that death could not mar it utterly, the brothers and sisters in whose hearts he had made a place for ever, the little son and daughter who already felt the loss of his strong arm and tender voice, the young children sobbing for their kindest playmate, and the tall lads watching with softened faces a scene which they never could forget, a very simple service and very short for the fatherly voice that had faltered in the marriage sacrament now failed entirely as Mr. March endeavored to pay his tribute of reverence and love to the son whom he most honored. Nothing but the soft coo of baby Josie's voice upstairs broke the long hush that followed the last amen. Till, at a sign from Mr. Bear, the well-trained boyish voices broke out in a hymn so full of lofty cheer that one by one all joined in it, singing with full hearts and finding their troubled spirits lifted into peace on the wings of that brave, sweet psalm. As Meg listened, she felt that she had done well, for not only did the moment comfort her with the assurance that John's last lullaby was sung by the young voices he loved so well, but in the faces of the boys she saw that they had caught a glimpse of the beauty of virtue in its most impressive form, and that the memory of the good man lying dead before them would live long and helpfully in their remembrance. Daisy's head lay in her lap, and Demi held her hand, looking often at her, with eyes so like his father's, and a little gesture that seemed to say, "'Don't be troubled, mother, I am here,' and all about her were friends to lean upon and love, so patient, pious Meg put by her heavy grief, feeling that her best help would be to live for others as her John had done.'